guys, this is Fergal from Poker VIP. Welcome back for part two of the next step for beginners starting out in cash game poker. So we're going to be playing over on BetSafe Poker. It's going to be following the exact same format as previously. We're going to be playing three tables this time of 10 and L. I'll be, it's a live play video, so I'm going to be talking you through my thought process as we go. And as I said, hope, as in the previous videos, hopefully we'll pick up some interesting spots and get to discuss some interesting theory. So we're going to jump straight into the action. I've just sat down. Uh, while I was getting set up, we have actually managed to lose a stack over the top right table when we ran a top pair hand into a better hand, which is unfortunate. So we're down a little bit over here. But uh, other than that, we've just started our session. That was just while we were getting up and running. And we're going to jump straight in. So we have a limper over on the top right table. We have 10 jack in the small blind. We're going to bring it in. We're going to ISO the limper. He's in for five euro and he's open limping for the cutoff. So following on from previous theory in previous videos, we're going to assume that this guy isn't particularly good and we're going to be looking to play a lot of pots against him. So we have the board, we block hands like queen jack and queen 10, which is good. We are going to fire. If he calls on this board, we're pretty much just going to give up. It's going to be very much a one and done bet, but I think he's going to be playing so straightforwardly that that will bet will pick it up more than enough that will turn a pretty tidy profit. And we're going to bring in the 7-5-0 suit in for a min raise from the button. Uh, we get called. We flop two over cards, which is pretty unusual with a hand like 7-5. We're going to bet out. We're going to bet out quite big. We want to, We really want to just... Actually, we're just going to go ahead and pot it here. We really want to discourage people from floating with random over cards, which are ahead of us. So by potting it here, we just give them a terrible price to draw if they have any hands like 10-jack or anything like that. Whereas if we only bet half pot, they might be tempted to peel since they figure they probably have live cards. And when we have position, we can play appropriately on later streets if we do get called. So we take it down without a fight, which is obviously the best case scenario when you only have the seven high. And the six on the jack. And the seven five offsuit when it has been raised before us is going to be a fold. As is the six and the nine offsuit. So nothing going on at the moment. Uh, six jack, if it was suited, I would be tempted to bring it in for a steal. Uh, it's right at the bottom, like that would be kind of close to the bottom of my stealing range, but we do open from the button very, very wide. Uh, king queen off suit is obviously a very straightforward open here. Uh, I'd be opening this from any position, from the cutoff is mandatory in my opinion. Bit of a pot brewing there where we had an all in but no caller. Uh, we get three bet. We don't know anything about this guy yet. We only have six hands on him. I'm not planning on folding just yet. We're going to call him. We're going to see a flop. We're going to float one street here and look to take it away on turns if he checks to us on the turn. Uh, we're going to have a lot more jack x than he is in his three betting range, so we're going to go ahead and, especially when you choose this sizing, it makes it a really, really easy float. And he goes ahead and he checks to us, so we're going to stick with our plan. We do pick up the queen, like this is more of an incentive to check back when we pick up some equity. Like we have a gut shot, we have overs, and we have diamonds now as well, but we are going to go ahead and stick with our plan and fire a bet. Interesting. I mean, I would have expected him to double barrel his king high and his ace high flush draws, or certainly his ace high flush draws. Hmm, what have we put ourselves in here? I mean, I don't think I'm folding the third nuts here. Fourth nuts, actually, seven of diamonds beats us. Hmm, I'm not loving this, but we're not going to fold here. Just too good, a, just too good a run out for him to bluff at, basically. So he is sticking in the bluff, so we are ahead, which we like. He had two pair on the turn. I'm kind of surprised he didn't fire again on the turn there, but hey. We won't complain. We pick up two pair on the top right table, which we like. We are going to have a bet. No, re no reason to go small at all. If he has a hand he's going to call with, he's probably going to call any reasonable sizing, so... I figure we should charge him as much as we can in that instance, where we almost certainly have the best hand. And the pocket twos, we are going to be bringing it in for an open if it's folded to us. If there was a raise before us, I'd be happy to call here in position against the initial raisers. 
But we get to be the aggressor, which is always nice. And we take down the blinds without a fight, which we definitely do not hate. We don't, wouldn't have, obviously wouldn't have minded a call there, but taking down the blinds is definitely a fine result for pocket twos. And queen four suited. And definitely some people think this is too wide. I would be of the opinion that any suited queen is more than good enough to be stealing blind versus blind. And we flop top pair at the back door flush draw. Let's have a bet for value. We're going to check here now, just pop, pop control it a little bit. We're not check folding. Uh, we are going to fold to the three bet when under the gun plus one three bets is over here. Uh, we're just going to check call here. Obviously there are... A reasonable amount of hands that we're afraid of here. We're still ahead of his kind of floats, which he is definitely going to have some of. When he double barrels, when he chooses this sizing, I'm not convinced that we're ever really ahead here. Uh, this size just seems like it is very, very value heavy. We don't really have much information on this guy, but over the small sample that we do have, he seems to be reasonably passive post flop. Uh, when he double barrels this river, I expect him to have the best hand pretty much. Not always, but very, very often, so we're just going to let him have this one. All of his flush draws got there. He's, he can definitely have better queens than us there. He's value betting, uh, and it's kind of hard for him to have bluffs there, basically. So I think letting it go is going to be absolutely fine. Uh, Ace-10 over here on the straight to the board. We're going to oh, go ahead and overbet here because we're going to assume this guy is always going to have bet a 9. So we're going to overbet and try to get him to fold the chop, which he does, which we like. So anytime you're playing the board and you take down the pot is a fantastic result. And we have top pair top kicker over on the bottom left table. Now we're just going to bet large for value now and bet river. Not lar not as large, but we are going to go reasonably reasonably big on the river if he called. We really want to punish his worst 10x there, like 10 jack, 10 queen, 10 king, those types of hands. And when he check calls the flop, I expect him to show up with those kinds of hands at least a reasonable percentage of the time. So those are the kinds of hands that I'm targeting there when I choose that sizing. So after the initial stack loss off camera while we were getting set up, we have managed to claw back a reasonable amount of it. Actually, we should probably top up here. Uh, so we have, we're up about six euro over on this table. We've clawed back a little over one euro on this table and we're down just under 140 on the bottom right table. So we've managed to claw back some of our early losses that were off camera and hopefully we can keep the trend going and turn a tidy little profit for the session. We're going to be recording back-to-back -back videos, ideally, as long as everything goes to plan. So hopefully the part three will be a direct follow on this. So hopefully we'll have a little bit of reads depending on how we go. It's just uh, time constraints. As long as I'm able to do that, I will be. Oh, we accidentally timed out here by mistake. Uh, the eight in the tray, obviously, we are going to be letting go. There is not much that we can do there at all with it. Uh, especially versus an under the gun open. Uh, this guy looks like he is definitely on the looser side of things to an extent. He's playing 28% of hands over 55, and he's raising 20% of them, so he seems like he is reasonably aggressive for sure. Potentially one of the better players in this pool. Time will tell, though we obviously still have a very small sample on him. It's very hard to have any faith in your stats when you have so few hands on people. Like, we only have 55 hands on this guy, and um, it's not really a sample size that you can start making accurate assumptions, but you certainly can start piecing together little bits and pieces of how you think they're going to be playing, which is very useful. So we have an ace and a ten on the top right table, which we are going to be playing. I'm going to, normally I'd be three betting this kind of hand. Versus this stack size though, we're going to go ahead and just flat call and see a flop. If we three bet here, it puts us in a really awkward spot because he is a very, very good size stack to be four bet jamming over us, and that just puts us in a ton of tough spots. If he's jamming hands like Let's say if he said jamming a hand like king queen suited, if we fold, it's obviously a disaster for our hand, but we can't we can't call a 40 big blind jam there, so I'm fine just calling and playing some post flop poker against him. Kind of sucks being out of position without the betting lead, but we're just in a situation where we kind of have to do it, unfortunately. We have an ace and a king, and they are of the same suit, which is fantastic news. So we are going to be three betting this hand. And we're just going to let the jack four go. So unfortunately, we don't get the chance to 3-bet, but we do get to raise blind versus blind. Hopefully this guy decides to play back at us. He does not, so we take that down without a fight. Again, never the worst case scenario when you win the pot, but obviously we would have preferred a little bit of action there. At least. 
Uh, eight nine has some potential to be played here, depending on how the action is before us. Uh, if it's small blind versus blind that raises, we are certainly going to at least call. If the button raises and the small blind folds, we may opt to use this as a three bet bluff, depending on the sizing. Looks like he might just time out though. And if we get a walk, we're very happy, obviously. So yeah, if this guy raises any reasonable sizing, we are going to probably just call and see a flop in position. That's what we're going to do. We flop an open ender. It's not a great open ender though, because obviously any queen will put, uh, any king will have a higher straight than us there. We're going to check this back and just pop control it a little bit. We have a straight, which we like. Uh, we're just going to call down two streets if he bets again. I mean, when he checks, we should have the best hand pretty often. We're going to bet, and if he raises, we're going to make a reluctant fold. It's obviously thin value here, but I mean, it's kind of hard for him to have that many hands that he wants to call with, but he may hear us. He doesn't. But as I said, when he checks there, it's very, very unlikely that he has a king, and I think we just have to go for value there, basically. He's going to be betting all of his king straights, all of his full houses, so unless he's a very, very trappy player, we should always have the best hand there. So when we always have the best hand, even if it's not all that likely we should get paid, we should try for value. Uh, we are going to 3-bet this guy. He doesn't have as big, as good a stack to be re-jamming over us, so it puts him under a bit more pressure than in the situation earlier on that arose when we were three bet, where we were thinking about 3-betting a 40 big blind stack. So those kinds of spots really show the importance of how you really need to be really vigilant as to what sort of stack sizes are at your table and how you should be adapting your play versus those stack sizes. It's, a, it's an extremely important concept in No Limit Hold'em because a lot of your options are, while they're a fantastic option versus one stack size, they can quickly become a losing play versus another. Like so, a big, a big situation with that would be like you know your three bet bluffs. Uh, three bet bluffing a short stacker who's going to be much more likely to be getting the money in is obviously going to be a disaster. Uh, we're going to be folding the ace four from early position, and we're happy to see this guy rebuy after he just stacked off a king queen there. I'm not sure how much that was for, but it looked like it was a reasonable size pop. We're going to be bringing the 9-jack out of the same suit in for a raise from the cutoff. Button calls, which we don't like. Uh, obviously being out of position versus this player is going to make the hand harder to play. But we have a hand that has the potential to flop very, very well on occasion, so we don't mind it too much. Uh, we got 3-bet anyway. We're not looking to call this kind of hand in 3-bet pots versus this guy. When he 3-bets from this position... I mean, he doesn't. He he was. He's the player that we're talking about up here. He seems like he's on the more aggressive side, but so far he has not been aggressive with his three bets. He's only three betting three percent of hands so far over seventy three. That was actually it was um, four percent over seventy two hands just a moment ago. So that's a very very tight three betting range. Now again, it's a very very small sample that we can be making this ex that we we're making that assumption from. But I expect him to be pretty strong pretty often, and he does indeed show down the tens. And the button shows down the ace king, which I think was a mistake not three betting himself. I didn't actually see how the action went there. I'm assuming they probably just got, I presume ace king just re jammed on pre flop because otherwise he got it in with a gut shot and overs on the flop, which I don't love. And let's go ahead and have a three bet here with the ace eight. So as I said, so far, the fact that this guy shows down pocket tens in that three bet pot uh, definitely leads us to have a bit more confidence in our assertion that he might not be like three betting too often. But we still don't have a big enough sample to be able to say for sure. That, that, that's, that's for sure. Uh, this board is not very good for us, actually. My initial thought was to see about it. The more I think about it, the less I like doing that, though. We're going to just check and give this one up. This board should fairly hammer his 3-bet calling range pretty well, pretty damn often. Uh, he's going to have all sorts of pairs, he's going to have open-enders, he's going to have gut shots with overcards, he's going to have a lot of those types of hands, and trying to win this pot I think will be a challenge at best on this board. So uh, when, he, when he checked back the flop I was tempted to fire the turn, but we're going to stick with our plan. We're just going to check and give this one up on this board. Like we're, we're we're pretty close to the bottom of our range there, so there are some spots where we're happy enough just to give it up and let it go. Uh, a7 off suit versus under the gun, we're going to let this go on the button, and the ace8 suited has some potential to be used in an aggressive manner. 
we shall see how the action unfolds before us. And the 10-6 suited, we're just going to go ahead and call it because we're getting a very good price. And it sucks, obviously, versus an under-the-gun open, but I mean, we're, we're getting three and a half to one in our money. We have suited cards, and we're going to assume this guy is pretty bad because he is in for a less than half a stack. So we're going to call. We're going to be playing pretty fit or fold, pre-flop, but that's fine. And we got four bet here by Doomsday. We're going to let the ace-8 suited go. We have been 3-betting absolutely tons over on this table. I know like ever, ever since I've started on this side, I have been 3-betting a fair amount. So my guess is that this guy is using a hood. He's probably going to think that we're a little bit of a wild player, which I mean, we, we're definitely on the very aggressive side compared to the average player in the pool. So it is possible he's 4-betting us light there. And if he continues to 4-bet us, we will start making some light 5-bet gems. Like, so that would have been a decent contender to go ahead and stick the money in. If we, if we had some reasonable a reasonable idea that he is going ahead and, and four betting us like there basically that would be a really really decent five bet jamming hand because we block aces if he is the strong pocket pairs we still have the ace over card and we're suited which gives us an extra few percent equity as well which is always good and because we have the ace we're obviously blocking ace king ace queen and those types of hands as well people generally aren't going to be four betting ace queen and below though ace king would definitely make sense but we block a lot of his value for bets, basically, is what I'm getting at. Uh, the four and the jack, we are going to let go. We would not have flopped anything. This guy, over 26 hands, has played 64% of them so far, so... And he's in for less than five euro as well, so we're going to assume that this guy is close to drawing dead in these games, which is always fun. We're going to be, again... Kind of going out of our way to play pots against him now. It's really important to be able to identify people at the table who you're really comfortable playing big pots against. So, for example, uh, this guy's playing too many hands. This guy here seems like he's got reasonably reggish stats. This guy seems like he's got very tight reggish stats. Uh, this guy also seems relatively reggish, but um, I mean, just because their stats seem reggish doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to be particularly good. So we're not all that concerned. We have a sneaky disguised open ender here on the top right table, which we like. Any king, any nine for the nuts. Uh, we're going to go ahead and fire a second barrel here. We're going to bet one into 110 to see if we can get him to fold a queen. Uh, he goes ahead and he calls. the case now of whether we want to fire three streets i don't think we do i think when he does call when he check calls twice i think he's going to have an ace pretty damn often and i don't think he's planning on folding it so we're just going to let this go it is ace nine i don't think he's ever planning on letting that go so we could have we could have checked back the turn as well but i think the double barrel definitely will accomplish a lot in that he will fold his queen x that um is a great result for us and let's go ahead and stick with our aggressive three betting strategy at the big blind and see if we can get this guy to lay down his hand. Again, this isn't an amazing board for us, but it is be probably this board is better for our range than it is it is his it compared to the 10 jack x board that we talked about earlier on. So we are going to fire a C bet here, see if we can take this down. And we are going to go ahead and ISO with the ace eight versus the limper. Uh, this guy does call, so we're not we're definitely not firing two streets here. We're just very much checking and giving this up. Let's hope he just checks back a hand like 10 jack and we are somehow ahead, but I do expect to lose this an overwhelmingly large percentage of the time. So he's calling three bets of queen nine suited. Not absurd, but I don't think particularly good either. Especially out of position. It's just gonna, it's gonna put him in a lot of tough spots where he's got a middling strength hand and I'm putting him under a lot of pressure with a better hand and he doesn't really know what to do. This one go. Right, we're going to call here with the pseudo connectors, see if we can encourage a multi way pot. Three betting would definitely be a viable option here as well. So, this is actually a pretty interesting kind of uh, because. 
my the HUD that I'm using is going to be displaying stats for that specific table. Kind of goes to show you how different stats can be depending on just purely the strength of cards that you get throughout a small sample. So over on this table, I'm playing a 15% 15% of hands over 30 hands, and on this table I'm playing 29% over just over 30, so 36. So I'm playing almost double the amount of hands on this table than I am on this one. Which, you know, if we so if we start if we start looking at my different profiles on each table, we'd have wildly varying assumptions based on my play. So here I look like an absolute nit, that three bets a reasonable amount. Here I look like I'm very, very loose aggressive, and here I look uh, probably loose aggressive here as well, actually but not as wild as on this table. So the exact same player playing on three different tables is showing very, very different stats. So it's a really, really good exercise to show how different people can interpret you just based on the sample that they have on you. Uh, flop top top over here, which is fantastic news. We're gonna go ahead and have a bet for value. We want to charge his flush draws. We want to charge his worst king X. Uh, his flush draws get there, which is unfortunate. Uh, if he leads here, we are going to call. If he checks, we are going to bet again. I'd be really upset if he check raises. Definitely don't love this lead. We are going to call. If he, if he leads again, we will consider letting it go. Uh, purely because it's kind of hard for him to be doing this as with a bluff that often. Depending on his sizing, we'll, we'll make an assessment. I mean. Kind of sucks. Like he's repping flushes and flushes only. Is he ever doing this with the worst king? He could maybe be doing it with like king queen with the queen of clubs or something like that. Curiosity is going to get me the better of me on this one. I'm not sure if this is going to be a good call or not in this pool, but I think we're just too far up the top of our range. He does have the flush, which definitely doesn't surprise me. That is potentially a bad call on my part. Um. We possibly could have considered folding just purely because it's kind of hard for him to have many bluffs when he takes that line when he when he check calls the flush card comes in and he donk leads twice it's just really really difficult for him to have bluffs so i'm kind of annoyed at myself there i don't think that was a particularly good call but meh, i'm not gonna worry too much about it i mean it, it, it's never gonna be atrociously bad but it's one of those spots where and by never gonna be atrociously bad what i mean by that is that a lot of people are going to be losing the same amount of money if not more in that situation so the reciprocity of that hand is fine because if I'm in the other if I'm in the other guy's shoes, I'm gonna be winning the same amount of money in in general, and that's that's the kind of way that I tend to look at poker. Like if, if I'm in a spot where I lose a stack, if in the same spot, if I have the other guy's cards and he has my cards and he's gonna lose a stack as well, I don't really care too much. But it's one of those spots where I could have enhanced my edge, basically, is what I'm getting at. So we're going to call here with our top pair. Let's see a turn. Uh, very promising that this goes check check we almost certainly have the best hand here now it's just a case of whether we want to bet for thin value ourselves or do we want to check and induce bluffs i think we're gonna i think we're gonna bet for value ourselves try to get called by like pocket nines pocket tens those types of hands uh, he does go ahead and fold them Pretty easy open here with the king six suited. Any suited king, we are stealing blind versus blind. We're gonna ISO versus this limper here. This guy beats us to it. We're gonna let the king king eight suited go when we're out of position then. And we're opening ace ten from under the gun at the table because we have one guy sitting out. It's essentially mid position. Uh, this guy calls, which doesn't surprise us at all. He's slowly but surely whittling down his chips. I'm going to check to this guy and look to bet turns and rivers if he checks back. We're not going to allow him to see a turn for this cheap. When he, when he min bets here, he should never have a jack. So we're not all that very afraid. And as I said, I'm just not allowing him to get to the turn for that cheap when he min bets. So we're going to bet again for value here. Charge all of his draws. Charge his worst 10x. That is possibly the worst card in the deck for us. Almost certainly the worst card, which is bad for us. 
I mean, we can't, we just can't call now. This, as I said, this card just it it's hit every single hand that we were targeting essentially. So um, this is yeah, this is bad. I, I, I would have been happy to call down on any brick, but when this flush draw gets there, the his open enders, his gut shots with over cards, everything like that, have either hit a straight or hit a pair, and we're just so rarely ahead now. We have to let it go. Kind of sucks, but. We've played in a way where we're kind of put ourselves in that awkward spot, but I'm very comfortable with our fold there, and I'm pretty confident that we had the best hand up until the river. So all of the money went in, I would imagine, when we're ahead, and that's all that we can do. We've got to check call the flop, as I said, but when he, when he min bets and he shows so much weakness, I prefer just going for a thin value and trying to charge the maximum for him. We're going to bet here with our overs and our gut shot. We're going to open the king deuce here in the three hand table. Hopefully, this table doesn't break. Ideally, we'd like to see some people turn up here. And we're going to fire a bet here with our back doors. We have back door spades. We have a, any six gives us an open ender, and there's a few other cards that will give us a good shot. And obviously, any ace gives us a pair as well. And we're going to have a three bet here with the ace ten, and we are going to open with the pocket sixes. Definitely don't mind the short handling game, but it, it makes recording videos that little bit trickier. Uh, this guy over 80 hands seems very, very nitty, uh, so we're not getting the right price to set mine against him, and I'm definitely not comfortable getting 50 big blinds in pre with pocket sixes versus a guy that looks this nitty. So we're just going to go ahead and let this go. Never fun folding pocket pairs in that instance, but calling is going to be an absolute spew versus that particular player. There's a lot of other players that I'm always going to be jamming over there, but him not so much. And no 9 on our flop over here, but it's not the worst of boards by any stretch. Uh, betting for value seems very optimistic, and betting as a bluff seems bad, so we're going to check and we're going to call. Got my own ender, which is nice. An extra overcard rolls off, which is bad for us, but we do have a lot of extra equity now as well, which is good. Hmm. It's just a case of whether we want to bet or not. I think we're going to check and see if we can induce another bluff from this guy. Because I'm kind of, I, I would have expected him to bet his Jack X on the turn. Not necessarily always. He definitely might be pocket trolling those types of hands, but yeah, nice. So we get him to jam with the 6 3, which is obviously fantastic for us. And we pick up extra chippies where other people might not have. Uh, we're going to be 3-betting the ace and the queen, which is obviously pretty standard in a 3 handed game. This is the guy who 4-bet us earlier on. If he had 4-bet us again, we would have been all in. Uh, we're delighted that this goes check-check, because if he had bet, it would have put us in an awkward spot. We're going to check again. We're not necessarily check-folding here. We are still ahead of a reasonable amount of his range. King 9 checks back, interesting, okay. I would have expected him to be betting all of his pairs there when we checked him, so fair enough. We were wrong about what he is going to be doing on the flop, which is fine, but hey. We give him some extra chips, and unfortunately, when we're, when we're potentially construed as a spewy player, unfortunately, when we have the kings, we get no action, which is not what we wanted. And we're going to be bringing the video to a close now pretty soon. Six and the queen, we are going to let go. Uh, we're going to be stealing with the ace knight suitor. This is probably going to be our last hand of the session. We will be back with part three, though. 
So again, as always, if anyone has any questions or comments about any of the hands that we've played throughout, feel free to leave them on the relevant social media. You can go, you can leave them on the YouTube videos, which I check every now and again, or also over on the Poker VIP forums, which I do check a bit more frequently. And I'm always more than happy to discuss strategy or anything like that with anybody out there. So yeah, this is going to be our last hand of the session. And it's not going to be a particularly big one by the looks of it. We're certainly not going to be looking to play a massive pot on this board. We're happy to check back here in pot control. Obviously not a very good run out. It's one of the very few times where we have top pair and I'm not going to be looking for any value at any point. Obviously, just any. it's just so hard for him to have a hand he can call us with here, essentially. So we're just going to check back. Uh, Ace-Deuce probably would have called, which is kind of tilting, but hey. We're not going to worry too much, and we are going to be re-raising the Ace of the King, though. And we take that one down. So as I said, this has been Fergal from Poker VIP. Thank you very much for watching, guys, and I'll be back again soon for part three. Take care.